So, Seamus, I see uh, Magnolia Cambelli are just coming into flower here. It's beautiful. Just pink starting flowers, yes. to give a wow. really spectacular display. Incredible. That yeah. lovely pink against the blue sky. We've got a whole new collection in the wall garden. Great, take great, a look. very excited yeah. to see that, yeah. Just in here. Excellent. Okay, Seamus, so here we are in the field nursery at Kilmacurra. So, what are we looking at here? So this is the, the future of the new Magnolia collection. It's part of the growing on of the Magnolia. So we've got an excess of over 100 Magnolias, wow. uh, about yeah. 38 yeah. different species, and the rest are sort of selected forms and cultivars. But within the species, uh, we've got a lot of sort of threatened, rare and vulnerable plants. It's interesting you say that because the importance of these ex situ collections, that, that's collections outside of their natural habitat, is, is really vital for Magnolia conservation. Um, as an instance, uh, globally, a recent uh, report showed that there are approximately 58,000 trees, total trees, on the planet. Um, and about 30% of those are threatened with extinction. Mm -hmm. And magnolias fall within that as being one of the most threatened groups of plants. Um, about 40 to 50% of magnolias are threatened with extinction in the wild. Okay. That's a really, really significant That's number. Very significant. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, so there are many attempts globally to conserve these uh, threatened species and to understand what's there, what's threatened, what are the main threats that are, that are resulting in this very high number of plants that are close to extinction. Of those plants that are, ex are threatened, there's about maybe 170 or so that are threatened with extinction. Only about 40% of those 170 species are, are, are in ex situ cultivation. One of the strategies, um, important global strategies for plant conservation um, has a target where we're trying to achieve 75% uh, of threatened plant species in cultivation. Magnolias are just above 40%, so we can see we're way short of achieving that, that number. Yeah, there's a lot of work still to be done. So this type of collection here at Kilmacurra is absolutely vital for that. Um, we, can, we can look at individuals uh, we have here in the collections, like for example, Magnolia zenii here beside me on my left. This is one of the most threatened magnolias uh, in the wild. There are about 18 plants growing in a single population on a mountain in, in southern China. So it's 18 great. plants, that's it. Okay. So having a plant like this in a collection is absolutely vital. We don't know, we don't contain a huge amount of, let's say we don't um, capture all of the genetic diversity in a single individual plant, but that individual acts as a, as a great beacon uh, for raising awareness in terms of conservation, conservation threats for this group. So, Although a, a visitor may come here and have a look at this plant when it eventually goes out into the garden, with some interpretation, we can very easily and carefully uh, inform the visitor, whether it be professionals or lay people or whatever it might be, into the importance of this species and how threatened it is and how the collections at Kilmacur and other gardens around the world, uh, Glass Nevin and so on, um, are, are providing a, an excellent tool for, for um, con conservation information. And so yes, on. and of course, letting the public know the plight of, of these species uh, yeah. due to habitat loss. Yes, yeah. habitat loss yeah. seems to be, I think there are a number of key features have been identified in the recent um, red list that was compiled for Magnolia. And habitat loss is, is the most uh, destructive element in terms of, of, of plant loss. Uh, over exploitation of Magnolia in the wild is a, is a big problem. And actually the very nature of magnolias themselves, they're quite slow growing. Mm -hmm. So natural regeneration in, in wild populations is quite slow. So again, growing plants like this, um, seed banking where you can magnolia is also very important. So these ex situ collections that exist at Kilmacurra, you may only have one or two individuals, but those one or two individuals may end up being the last of that particular species. So that particular individual that you have, let's say magnolia zenii, mm -hmm may become a key feature in, in population or habitat, population regeneration in the future. Maybe seed collected from this specimen could be very useful for regenerating populations in the wild. So not only are they important for an educational and public awareness point of view, but they may also hold a key for, for reducing the loss of these populations in the wild. I guess, Dara, it's using the gardens as a sort of a Noah's Ark, you know, yes, that exactly. should these plants become extinct in the wild, that at least it's, it's material, it's genetic material that we're preserving on site yes, and that yeah. potentially we can send it back to the wild again. Yeah. Because this is another good example, of course, it's Magnolia cylindrica. Yeah. It's it's uh, threatened in its native habitat as well. Like Xenia, it's a species from Southeast China. It's yeah. found on a single mountain range and its populations have been massively reduced yeah. through habitat degradation yeah. over the course of the 20th yeah. century. Another interesting thing about Magnolia, which I, which I didn't realise until recently, is that there 
are about 330 or so uh, species identified. Um, but since 2007, since the first red list was compiled, 93 species have been newly uh, identified, which is an incredible number when you think about it. And a lot of that is to do with people exploring new areas, going into parts of the world where people haven't been before, haven't botanized before. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think people will be astounded by, because I think when you say magnolia, you automatically think of Asia and that part of the world. But actually, South America, the neotropics contain vast numbers of magnolias. Many are newly described and probably many more in the wild to be discovered. So it's a very exciting genus, very threatened as, we, as, as we've discussed a few moments ago, but also lots of new species, potential new species out there. So yeah. this kind of work is not only a Noah's Ark, but allows us as, as an, in our positions to go out into these areas and collect plants that have only been newly described. So it's a very exciting genus to be involved in. But you know, Dara, you can see the potential of these plants. You know, they're not just sort of botanically interesting. They're horticulturally, they're, uh, they're beautiful plants. You can see that plant in two weeks is going to create a spectacular sure, yeah, show yeah. here. So these are the very trees that will be moved from here out into the garden and our visitors will have the opportunity to see this great floral display here. Sure, yeah over the next, not just decades, they're very long-lived trees, so for the next century and a half, yeah, the, the, sure. these, these trees will give great pleasure to Planting visitors. Planting for the future, to, yes, yes. Exactly, yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, that, that, that's an interesting thing. So visitors can come here, generations and generations will come and see the, these beautiful plants flowering. But very few people um, have had the opportunity to see these plants growing in the wild. And I know you're one of those very lucky people who've seen these things. Uh, growing the natural habitats. Maybe you could just have a quick chat about that and describe what yeah. it looks like. Yeah, well actually, by chance, one of the most interesting species I've sure. seen goes against the north facing wall of the wall garden. It's just here. Do you want to take a look? Yes, yes, please, yeah. Seamus, I, I noticed this um, very striking pink uh, flower has just opened on the Magnolia Campbellii here. But I'm sure in previous years I've seen this as a, as a much lighter shade. Yeah, it's funny you should say that because um, last year, about this time of year, I was yeah. at Kerhays Castle in Cornwall, which has one of the biggest collections of magnolias in Britain and Ireland. It's been led by the head gardener, Jamie Parsons, and I asked exactly the same question, and he explained it to me. Um, the depth of colour is determined by the previous season. So okay, has yeah, it been a really yeah. wet year? Has it been a, a warm year? So last year, of course, we had a lovely summer here in Ireland, and the flower colour is, is more of a, a, a deep rose colour sure, than yeah, the usual yeah, pink. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it does actually change the depth of colour. Yeah, um, the, the, yeah. And that, again, is determined by the previous okay. summer and the heat it gets. And in, just in, in terms of the size of this specimen, so the plants, you've seen plants in the wild, you see plants in various gardens around the world. How does this compare in terms of its, its size? Well, this is a huge old beast. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's very historic. Uh, it's one of the best known trees, not just in this garden, but throughout Britain and Ireland. Um, but what is amazing to relate to people is that when you see this in the wild, it's well over twice this height. Huh. So I've walked through yeah. entire woodlands of it on the Sikkim Nepal border, and they're 120 feet tall wow. overhead. That's incredible. It forms a forest tree on its own. Um, wow. And it is variable in the wild. Yeah, so sure. uh, the colour, uh, when it was first discovered by William Griffith, who worked for the East India Company, he found it at Trongsa in Bhutan in the 1830s, but the form he found was white flowered. So okay. uh, you do get Magnolia campylli alba group, but okay. then if you fast forward 10 years later, Joseph Dalton Hooker, the English botanist, he traveled to the hill station at Darjeeling yep. in what's now West Bengal. It was part of Sikkim at the time. And Joseph Hooker, he records seeing it. And of course he named it, but he records standing at the hill station, looking out onto all the intervening mountains. And he said the flanks of peaks were painted this sort of rose shade wow, just by the sheer number. It was just pure magnolia woodland as far as the eye could see creating this spectacular effect. And that, that, that type of, what, what Hooker would have seen at that time, I mean, sadly, I think a lot of that has gone now. We've lost a lot of that cover. Yes, yes. And uh, I mean, again, we're going back to what we were talking about earlier on, habitat loss has resulted in a vast numbers of these species, or these, these specimens disappearing from the landscape, which is, a, yeah. which is a real shame. It is a real shame because um, in this case, what happened at Darjeeling was, just as Joseph Hooker arrived at Darjeeling, yeah. Robert Fortune had been collecting tea for the British East India Company. Uh, he introduced tea to Darjeeling. He formed this massive new business, a really lucrative business. But the, all of those magnolia forests were felled in shocking numbers to make way for tea gardens. That's all awful, of their yeah. timber yeah. was used yeah. for making tea chests to export it back to, to Europe again. 
Um, so it, if you visit Darjeeling today, you need to be prepared to drive for almost two and a half hours before you meet the next band of pure magnolia woodland. So you need to drive right onto the Nepal border. So all yeah, sure. that section, huge space have been uh, cleared away. So we need to, when, when we have our drink of tea in the evening or in the morning, we need to be uh, cognizant of, of what's happened in the past and uh, the results of, of this. the damage that it's done yes, to yeah. not just the magnolias, but the, the plants and animals that lived yeah, in those yeah. forests around it as well. Speaking of, speaking of damage, I can see this Cambellii, you're talking about the sheer size and scale. It's giving this wall a seriously serious hard time here. It's given it a, a tough time, uh, Dara, because of course uh, it's been here a long time. Yeah. Um, yep. So it will be in three years' time. It will have been planted here 150 years ago. It's got a fascinating history um, because it started life as a seedling at Dara Sheeling, and it was true Sir George King, the superintendent yep. of the Calcutta Botanic Gardens. He arranged to have seedlings, including this tree. So it began life as a little seedling in the mountains above Dara Sheeling. Um, it was. Uh, Sent down to Calcutta. In Calcutta, it was packed into a Wardian case, yeah. a small sealed glass house. It was put on the deck of a ship. It was sailed back to Europe, planted against this wall in 1876. But look at the damage it's done on yeah, both sides. Yeah. So it's lifted the entire wall up. But uh, it's, it's worth the butter for the spectacular show that you get because this tree in 1920 was said that it carried about a thousand blossoms. We reckon it's two and a half times that today. That's so and it creates such a spectacle and you can see the buds are just expanding and about to pop now. Our neighbour is three miles away as the crows flies. They can see it from the other That's side amazing. of the valley. And of course the earliest uh, sort of hint of what was yet to come because it didn't really begin to blossom until the 1870s. So for a long time, the botanists in, in India tried to send it home through seeds. And every time that that seed traveled through the tropics, the seeds desiccated. Sure. And that's why they sent plants instead. Okay. But yeah. long before it began to bloom in British and Irish and European gardens, in 1855, this wonderful huge Floralegia that you and I were looking at in yep, the office yep, earlier yep. today, um, it was produced by originally by Indian artists uh, based in Darjeeling who worked for a retired Bengal judge, John Ferguson Catcart. And he had Indian artists who he had Joseph Hooker retrain in European botanical art styles uh, paint him. He was sailing back to Europe, he was traveling to uh, Switzerland and he died very suddenly and he left a thousand of these folio drawings to Q. Joseph Hooker had them reworked by Fitch, by Waterhood yeah, yeah, Fitch. Yeah. And the very first Western depiction appeared in that book in 1855 and it caused enormous excitement amongst sure, yeah. gardens. Yeah. And then, so eventually these living plants came back. They failed in the south of England. All the early successes were in Cork. So the very first flowering was at Lakelands in Cork. It was the garden of William Horatio Crawford, the brewer. Um, and it flowered in his garden in 1878. It yeah. created such a spectacular effect that Joseph Hooker travelled the whole way from Kew in London to see this tree. And then of course that book that you and I looked at earlier, that was gifted to the gardens at Glasnevin by William Gumpleton yep, in yep. 1911. The second flowering in Britain and Ireland was in Gumpleton's garden in 1908. The plant carried hundreds of flowers, but this is the one that they waited for forever. It, it, it must have been incredible. If you can imagine where we, we were so much used to traveling the world now, it's very easy for us to do that. But you imagine at that time, bringing a plant, such an exotic specimen back, and then flowering with such showy flowers, it must have been mind blowing. For and to think here. that these plants were coming from the subcontinent, yeah. you know, that, because it was believed that these were extremely tender plants. That's why it was planted against this north facing wall, it was to protect it against the yeah. excesses yeah. of frost and cold. You can see that they tried to train this tree like an espalier apple, yeah, yeah. which is ridiculous because it gets to be as big as an, an, an oak tree. If, um, if you, uh, just a uh, curiosity, if, how long can they live in the wild? Is, do you have any idea how old magnolias can get? varies from species to species, yep. so it does depend. So we looked at Magnolia delavei earlier, which can live yep. for several centuries. Um, the oldest Magnolia Campbelli uh, in gardens are the trees at Fota and the trees here at Kilmacara. Okay. Okay. So this old beast is, is, is approaching a century and a half. Wow. And uh, well, I hope we get several more decades from I'm it. I'm sure, well, it's been well looked after. And you can see the tree, not only is the tree old and, and strong and flowering beautifully, but it's also supporting a lot of life as well. Yeah. So looking at these uh, these mosses and ferns here, very yeah. happy on these, on these aged, well, wizened branches. Well, when Beautiful. you think that uh, it has 
delighted visitors to this garden since 1907. Yeah. So, you know, you hope that it will give joy for decades to come. Yeah, great. But, you know, in when we lead our tour on Magnolia Week, on, on, on the Friday, day 10th of March, this should be a spectacular uh, Real site Real showpiece in the for people, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. So Seamus, I just see as we're leaving the uh, the field nursery here, this Magnolia Dolstapa has caught my eye. Uh, we, we had it uh, last year, it flowered magnificently in Glasnevin. Beautiful white scented flowers, really was a talking point of the garden uh, last year. Mm. Um, I assume it'll do better here. Glasnevin is, is fine, but the conditions are not perfect for Magnolia, whereas Kilmacura things are really, really perfect. I'm sure this plant is going to make a really beautiful specimen yeah. in years to come. Um, yeah. It is. Uh, a species that likes to be in a woodland setting with lots of shelter and of course our acidic soils and our higher rainfall yeah, than yeah. Glasnevin uh, suits it a, a lot as well. Um, and again this is something that when you see it in the wild uh, it is incredible the scale of the tree. You cannot explain to people just how big this tree grows. Yeah. In places like Nagaland in northeast India on, on the borders with Burma I've seen it and its bowl is bigger than any oak that you'll see in Britain and Ireland. It's just a whopping great tree. We're so used to seeing these things in, in gardens and we never get that scale. No. So and it must of, be mind-blowing. Of course it's relatively new to cultivation. You know, it's early 20th century so it still needs a, a lot of catching up. Sure. But the fact that it is regarded by Nepali carpenters you know, as a really good tree for house construction. It gives yeah. you a good yeah. idea yeah. of of the fact that it is, it's a timber tree. So we look at these uh, magnolias as ornamental trees. Yeah, yeah. But actually, around the world, they're used in the construction of houses and also all sorts of all sorts of buildings believe, um, as well. I, 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 true or not? Now I don't know, but I, I believe this is also has a sort of a sacred element to it that it's used in in Buddhist monasteries. Yes, yeah, uh, that's absolutely true. Uh, when we were traveling in Sikkim, in the Lachen Valley, yeah. we visited, um, it was a, an 18th century Buddhist monastery that was being restored and we met the people that were involved in its restoration. So they told us that the only timber that was considered sacred enough for altar work when they were restoring the altar within that structure was Magnolia Dolsopa. So I think nice we should, tree. just touching the tree, there's something quite sacred about there that. There is that. actually, it's one yeah. of those trees yeah. Yeah. very yeah. often actually that are, just like here in Ireland, we have our own sacred trees. Yeah. This, yeah. this is something that's sacred across uh, the Himalaya. Fantastic. And as I say, you know, it's a, it's a tree that is relatively new to cultivation. It yeah. was introduced to cultivation by George Forrest, uh, the famous sure. Scottish plant sure. collector. So he was collecting in part for J.C. Williams at Kerry's Castle in Cornwall, where his original specimens grow. Um, and what's interesting about that is, is that this, of course, is propagated from the collections at Kerry's, supplied by Burn Coos. Um, and if you go back a hundred years ago, uh, just before the Great War, Captain Acton, who was managing the estate here at the time, he was corresponding with J.C. Williams. They yeah. were swapping plants, and it was on the site of this very field nursery that we've created in recent years. This is where Captain Acton was growing his plants. Also, wow, that's, yeah. yeah, very special connection. Yeah. Of course, laterally, if you look at the leaf, you can see it comes from a very wet part of the world. Nagaland's one of the wettest places in the world. So when you see these long drip tips, yes, you, yeah, you know yeah, immediately yeah. this is something that's growing in a place that gets High rainfall, huge yeah. amounts of rainfall. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's really important to remember when you're planting it in your garden. Don't give it a dry spot. Yes, yes, yes. Fascinating.